So thank you uh, for the invitation, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. So yeah, I'm going to talk about Dynatrix exact sequences using uh, Lagrangian comparisons that I presume you uh, heard about a couple of times in this semester. Uh, so this is John work with Chuck Umek. He's a grad student in University of Minnesota. So let me give you um, some background first. We want to talk about exact sequences, and uh, we definitely want to mention Saito's um, famous result on um, his exact sequence. Uh, so I listed something over here. So uh, the Saito's exact sequence actually has uh, two versions, as it appears. Uh, the most famous one probably is the Lagrangian version that you can see here. Um, so it says the, flow com the tensor product of uh, two flow cohomologies, uh, you use the evaluation map to map it to flow cohomology of L0, L1. Uh, then you have the uh, mapping cone in the uh, chain complex, um, um, in the chain complex uh, sense. This is the uh, flow cohomology of L0, and then the dyne twist along a Lagrangian SN of L1. This is the Lagrangian version, and then we also have the fixed point version. We can see that the flow cohomology of a simpletomorphism um, F uh, sit in the middle. And then uh, on the left hand side, you have the dyne twist. So this tau is actually the dyne twist of a Lagrangian sphere. So you compose these two simpletomorphisms, and then it maps to a uh, flow cohomology of uh, F itself. And then the mapping cone is going to be the flow cohomology of F apply on this uh, dyne to, uh, along this Lagrangian SN with SN. Uh, if you are familiar with the literature over here, so we use a little bit different uh, conventions than Saito, so the arrows look a little bit different uh, in its directions, but it's actually the same thing. And also we have a family version of dyne twist, exact sequence due to Wayham Woodward. And um, so we, uh, in this case, we consider the spherical coisotropic uh, submanifolds C over here. And then you can form this Lagrangian composition when you consider this uh, coisotropic uh, submanifold as a uh, Lagrangian correspondence, then you have a flow cohomology exact sequence as shown here. So today we will uh, provide a new proof for uh, all these results later. And then the second part of our background is the Lagrangian uh, surgery and cobordism theories. So this, is, uh, this was due to uh, Lalong and Sikharov uh, in dimension 4, and then uh, Potorich uh, extended to all dimensions uh, for the Lagrangian surgery. And then the Lagrangian cobordism theory is due to Biran and Cornea. So the first part about the Lagrangian surgery is that um, the setup is that you have two Lagrangian submanifold which intersect transversely at some point P. And then uh, in any dimension, uh, Leonard tells you that you can form a Lagrangian, um, a Lagrangian embedding, which is the, uh, which is the uh, connected sum of L1 and L2 along the point P. So you can, uh, you can uh, embed this into M, uh, the ambient simplified manifold M. So this is done by adding a handle in a double chart near this intersection P. What we did in uh, this uh, direction is that uh, we give several other approaches to do this surgery. Uh, this is, it's done in a slightly more global way, which is not just supported in a double chart. And also uh, our approach move uh, easily to clean intersections. And then for the Lagrangian cobordism theory, I'm not going to uh, talk too much about it because you already heard this from uh, Octave. So what I will mention, well, I'll just recap this in one picture. So a Lagrangian cobordism, of course, is a uh, Lagrangian submanifold in M times C. And then outside a compact set, it should all look like um, half rays. And then over this half rays, you have all products Lagrangian submanifolds. Uh, so you can, yeah. And then the way how it works 
is that you put a testing Lagrangian, and then uh, you consider the homotopy, uh, Lagrangian homotopy from this blue line to this uh, red line, and then you compute the flow cohomology for uh, for these two lines with the fixed Lagrangian cobordism, and then you argue they are actually chain homotopic. So this uh, line of consideration leads to their main theorem, which says that the cone of uh, L1, L2, L3, uh, you form a, an iterated algebraic cone. And then uh, this is uh, quasi-isomorphic to the algebraic cone on the right-hand side. Okay. So what we did is that uh, we construct, so for the, um, so-called more global surgery, we also construct um, corresponding Lagrangian cobordisms, and also we extend uh, the Lagrangian cobordism theory from embedded Lagrangians to immersed Lagrangians. Okay. And then the third part of our background is the so-called Hubrich's Thomas conjecture. So what does this say? If you look back at Seidel's picture, so what he actually established is that basically Lagrangian SN under mirror symmetry, well, philosophy, because when we look at a symplectic manifold, it doesn't necessarily mirror to a algebraic variety on the, on the B side. So, I mean, it's philosophically, it should be mirrored to some sort of spherical object if you just look at the homolog homological level. And then it should be, it should have uh, those properties that I list over there. And then you do the Lagrangian dying twist along a Lagrangian SN. Then supposedly it is mirrored to uh, the so called spherical twist on the B side as well. Okay. And what Seidel proved exactly is that this mirror on the second uh, row is true. Okay. Because you can actually match this cone, opera cone expression on the spherical twist on the B side. And then it exactly, you just change this to arbitrary Lagrangian. And then cone, this is a Lagrangian sphere, sphere, and then arbitrary Lagrangian. You, if you do this kind of uh, very naive uh, translation to the A side, this is exactly Seidel's Stein twist. Uh, could you say that again? Uh, the sphere of object D on the B side is, like in this case, is not, right? It's the mirror of the one sphere. Uh, so, as I said, this is sort of like philosophical okay, so because. So, in what sense is Seidel's proof? Uh, so, it's not really a. I mean, you don't actually have any homological mirror symmetry happening over here. But it's just like if you have some Lagrangian sphere on the A side, and for example, if we're in the Klar Biao, and then okay, then A side and B side are both. So A side is a symplectic manifold, and B side is an algebraic variety. Then this Lagrangian sphere is supposed well, is really mirror to a spherical object. So that would be true, because it's uh, I mean, it's just by description, it's just by definition over here. But uh, for gen general symplectic manifold, of course, a Lagrangian sphere is, I mean, the symplectic manifold is not mirrored to any uh, algebraic variety over C. So, I mean, and this spherical object is only defined on derived categories of coherent sheaf on smooth variety. It should be able to ex be extended to more general uh, categories, but uh, it's not defined yet. So what I was saying is just that I mean, under the f philosophy of mirror symmetry, there should be this sort of mirror correspondence. Seidel's result, Seidel's result huh? What did they prove? Si Seidel's result is uh, what we have in the first slide, right? Oh, well. So this Seidel's result is this, essentially. Yeah, I know, but. But uh, so basically, you just you, yeah. Well, maybe I should make it more precise. OK. So Seidel's result. Oh yeah. Seidel's result is that uh, 
Seidel's result is that um, so the dying twist, so tau S N L is quasi isomorphic to the cone of home S N L tensor S N two L. So this is Seidel's this is Seidel's result. And what I was saying is that if you compare this expression to this expression, it's exactly I mean mirror. Okay. Yeah. Is that more? Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, one way to interpret Seidel's result, which says that the Lagrangian sphere is the mirror of a spherical object. And then Hubrichs and Thomas consider the following question. So if you actually the Lagrangian dying twist can be uh, can be defined for any Lagrangian submanifold which emits a metric where all geodesics are closed and the spectrum uh, the length spectrum is rational. Okay, so uh, in particular, if you put, for example, Lagrangian CPN, you can define a dying twist. You just use a geodesic flow, and we will recall later. And then they sort of construct this uh, projective object in the derived category as well. And if you, sorry, it's a smooth CPN, and then it embeds into symplectic manifold as a Lagrangian. It's just like Lagrangian RPN, and you can consider Lagrangian HPN as well, so etc. <laughs> so they, uh, they construct this projective object on the derived category. And then on this side, they act, on the B side, they actually um, also conject, I mean, they constructed a formula for projective twist, which is, uh, which is given by this formula. And it is uh, auto equivalence on the derived category that they prove. Okay? So if you have a projective object, you can actually construct a uh, auto-equivalence on the derived category. So what they, what they guess is that on the left-hand side, so if you would, uh, I mean, if you look at this expression, you would expect it to be a Lagrangian CPN on the left-hand side, but it also has a dying twist. So the very natural expectation is that the dying twist on the A side is mirror to the uh, projective twist on the B side in the sense of comparing these two cone relations. OK? Yes. OK. Uh, there, I mean, yeah, the dying twist exact sequence is a completely uh, symplectic statement, but it's, uh, I mean, it's part of it's motivated by mirror symmetry. So it's like you want to guess what's, uh, what's the uh, dying twist effect on a Lagrangian CPN twist, but I mean, there's barely a way to really guess it. So basically, they try to move to B side and guess some algebraic operation, and then they guess this is exactly what is on the A side. So it's kind of, so no actual homological mirror symmetry statement is proved or used, but the philosophy is really what is behind these sort of uh, statements. OK, yeah. So. OK, so question is that really? I mean, really this is a mirror? And then. Uh, And what we prove is that yes, this is uh, this is really a mirror, which means that if you copy that uh, expression that Hugh Richards and Thomas uh, and translate it naively to the symplectic geometry, that's exactly the effect of Lagrangian CPN dying twist. And we prove also for um, okay, yeah. So there are some side remarks over here. So for example, we also prove this for is true for our Lagrangian RPN twist and HPN twist. 
um, and I mean some other uh, Lagrangians that uh, has certain uh, special properties. So uh, yeah, some side remarks is that uh, so first uh, why I mean these spherical objects and projective objects are not like sporadic uh, thoughts um, to come up with. So one thing is that they uh, so the spherical objects are particularly adapted to the so-called true caveat uh, due to, I mean in the language of uh, Hubrich uh, spoke. Uh, but uh, when I talk in, um, gave a talk in Harvard, I was corrected by Yao's, and he said this is should be called S U N Yao. So it's S B S U N Yao, and the projective twists are particularly adapted to hypercalar uh, manifolds. And uh, so the adapted means that the all line bundles are spherical objects in the S U N Yao, and they are all projective objects in hypercalar manifolds. And then uh, these two classes of manifolds due to uh, Bogomolov's uh, fundamental result, but uh, I think uh, Yao thinks this should uh, part, partly due to uh, Kabi as well. So I mean, w I I don't really know too much in this direction. But in any case, so uh, so these two kinds of uh, so S U and Kabi and Hypercalar, they should build. They should build all the Kabiyao, uh, which is uh, simply connected and compact, built in a sense that they can uh, decompose into products. And also, um, yeah, so one way that you can guess the projective twist um, formula, so why they actually guess this uh, projective formula, is to look at the Lagrangian S2 dying twist, which is also a CP1. So you can, uh, but the dying twist along S2 square equals the dying twist along CP1, just by definition. So, uh, so you can plug in the uh, spherical twist formula in dimension 2 and then just guess that it actually holds for higher dimensions so that to guess the projective twist formula. And uh, it works for some projective spaces and we will also mention how to determine some connecting maps. It is not uh, completely done uh, for the connecting maps uh, but we will mention some cases that it can be done. Okay. And the basic idea of the, of the proof is that so we talk about mirror symmetry without really mirror symmetry, but the proof also has some flavor of uh, mirror symmetry. So uh, I will mainly uh, focus on the spherical twist because the projective twist case has a little bit more. Um, things, uh, details to explain. But the basic idea should be clear uh, in a spherical twist case that we provide a new proof. Uh, so if you recall that the spherical twist on the B side is defined by a Fourier Mukai transform, and then the Fourier Mukai kernel is a cone uh, written over there. So you have spherical object and then you uh, exterior tensor product and then uh, there is a trace map to the diagonal, and then you take the mapping cone of this um, of these two guys. Okay. And then the philosophy that uh, we are sticking to is that symplectic Fourier Mukai transform should be realized as a Lagrangian composition, and it's not quite a mathematical statement again. So, uh, but we just believe this is true. Okay, and I'm actually currently trying to formulate a mathematical statement. But at least if you look at a uh, Fourier Mukai transform and then you insert everything to be a divisor and then you look at the output, it would look exactly the same. I mean the formula is exactly the same as the Lagrangian composition that you write x0, x1 and then this guy is in L0, that guy is in L1, whatever. So it looks exactly like that. And it works very nice uh, in our proof too, this philosophy. So we have uh, every reason to believe this is actually, I mean, this actually has some uh, mathematical meaning. Okay. And the second thing is that you want to do the cone in Fukai category. So because uh, we have a cone in here, we want to do this cone in the A side too. Then we kind of uh, hold a religious belief that uh, this can always be done in Lagrangian corporism. But this is not, 
I mean literally true because uh, so so it can't quite work if you really directly work on Seidel's uh, cone formula. So you want to cone these two guy, this guy with this guy. Uh, so the the whole point is that this uh, twisted complex, so this vector space portion, does not quite work. I mean, it's very difficult to put that CFSNL into Lagrangian Corboison. And we work very hard to do that uh, at some moment, but uh, I mean, it doesn't quite work. So we bypass it uh, by passing it to the functor level that we look at the products in platelet manifold. So the upshot, so basically one, one sentence re uh, recap on our proof is that we use Lagrangian corborism and surgery on the products in platelet manifolds. And then uh, we get the graph of dying twist so that's on the B side, and then this is mirror to the cones on Fourier Mukai kernels, which is like this. And then we prove that the graph of dying trees, so basically is um, mirror to the functor of the spherical twist on derived categories. So that's basically the philosophy behind the proof. So let's go a little bit into the details. So first I need to introduce you how we do the surgery. So um, the setup, the basic setup, is that we first choose a so-called admissible function. Uh, the graph is not, does not look very nice. And you will see this graph, I mean, the graph of this admissible function looks exactly like this. So it's decreasing and it uh, glues uh, smoothly to x-axis and y-axis, et cetera, et cetera. If you, uh, if you have seen um, Leonard or uh, Brian Konya's work, you will see this graph already. But the point is that, so in their, in their uh, setup, so this psi zero has to be very small. But in our case, we only want the support to be very small, but this psi zero can be anything. So this is the admissible function, first bit of data. And the second bit of data is that I have a sympathetic manifold, a Lagrangian submanifold, and the Lagrangian submanifold has some smooth submanifold. Okay, and then I form a conormal bundle in the in, in its uh, Weinstein neighborhood. And then the third part of the data is that you use the psi t, uh, sorry, the phi t, to be the Hamiltonian flow generated by uh, this uh, norm in in the cotangent vector, uh, which is a smooth function in the Weinstein neighborhood of Lagrangian L1. Okay, and then this h psi is the is just the geodesic flow cut off by this, uh, yeah, cut off by the psi function. So basically, in near the zero section, it can go very far, but the uh, outside just doesn't doesn't run at all. So, uh, so this is some geodesic, uh, uh, geometric description about uh, the geodesic, uh, the geodesic flow itself. But I don't want to mention too much about it. So uh, there are some small cartoon pictures of this uh, how how you should look at h psi. So if this is the uh, conormal bundle, then it flows out near the zero section and then it doesn't flow as much when you go up uh, and then that's an, like a 3D cartoon picture or whatever. So the lemma is that um, if you choose this Psi to be admissible in the sense of uh, Potorovich, uh, Long, Sikorov and Bironconia, then uh, your, hand, your Lagrangian handle that you flow out, so this Psi is called a flow handle, this flow handle is the same as the handle that they actually attach in the double chart. But one point is that our flow handle can actually go beyond injectivity radius. And for them, it's very important that you restrict on the double chart, and then you can actually implant a local model, which is just T star Rn. Okay. 
So let me, well, some words about why we really want to do these handles. So one thing is that it's easy to define for cleaning sections because we don't need to patch local models every time. And then uh, it's easy to construct a Lagrangian covariance that we will explain. And then it's very easy to compare with Dyn twist because if you are familiar with the definition of the Dyn twist, you can see that. So let me recall the definition of the Dyn twist. So for example, when this S has all geodesic uh, close and rational length spectrum, but let's just assume that the geodesics all has the same length, okay? For example, two pi. In this, uh, in this case, you take the Weinstein neighborhood T star S, and then you consider an admissible function so that Poseidon zero equals two pi. So then you do this kind of uh, flow um, in this T star S, then this flow is going to extend smoothly to the zero section. So you just extend by identity at the zero section. So this tau S is going to be such an extension, and it's going to be a um, simpletomorphism in T star S, which uh, fixes the zero section. But here you actually need a little bit of uh, of perturbation near the zero section so that it's really smooth. But uh, let's skip that. And then the flow handle, as you can see, because we exactly use this function. So the flow handle is exactly the uh, image of the same uh, flow, which means the following. So I will give you an example. So we want to look at the dying twist. We have this uh, S over here, and then you have a fiber. So let's assume S is SN or RPN, CPN, etc. So let's look at the case when S is an SN, okay? When you do the flow handle, this H per psi is going to get larger and larger if you take a per psi zero to be alpha. So alpha goes from zero to pi, then you flow uh, longer, f uh, further and further away from p. But uh, from, uh, for uh, time pi, you're going to hit here. For example, if you have an Sn, then this is just a point. So I mean, for alpha in 0 to pi, this is going to give you um, a dying twist just by, uh, just by you know, capping, so this orange part is the flow handle, you cap it by the black part that it doesn't cover. Okay, so this is the surgery, and then also this, uh, when it goes to time pi, this is by definition a dying twist, okay, for Lagrangian SN case. So this is a, a proof that the dying twist of the fiber is, um, is the surgery of FP with the zero section, okay? So, but in the case when S is, for example, CPN, if you just surgery uh, from, uh, for the uh, alpha between zero to pi, okay? Then what you get is a, is a surgery, definitely. However, this is not the dying twist, because for a dying twist, you need to flow for time two pi to go back to itself. You can't just go to the opposite divisor. So that's why you need to go further. For example, so you need to go beyond the injectivity radius. And then you, well, and then this is just um, within the definition of a uh, dying twist uh, of, the, uh, of the surgery that I defined. You can just go beyond, and then you can glue this top part. And that thing is the dying twist, OK? You can also show that, actually, this dying twist can also be factorized so, um, as FP surgery with CPN first. So you surgery uh, when this uh, parameter goes uh, from 0 to pi. But then, after you do this surgery, you surgery another copy of 0 section along the opposite divisor. And then this double surgery is going to give you the dying twist of uh, of the fiber. Uh, maybe, so maybe this 
uh, I try to supplement a picture that explains my point uh, in the simplest case when S is RP1. Okay. In RP1, what I was claiming is that you can do two things. One is to do the flow of time 2 pi. So on the top, you want to flow one round. So on one round. And then on the bottom, you also flow one round. So this is the dying twist of uh, RP1. Okay. But you can also do the following thing. You perturb another copy of L1. And then you do the surgery of L1, L2 uh, on this opposite divisor P. And then you get some this blue figure A. And then you surgery this FP with this blue figure A. You get to here as well. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I mean by the identity on the bottom of this slide. OK. OK. So there's uh, some further extension to this surgery story. So for example, if you have a Lagrangian in uh, L in M, and then it has a so smooth submanifold again, and you can decompose T star L into the direct sum of two uh, subvector bundles. So basically, you can just take any distribution, and then you just take the orthogonal complement of it. So you can get E1 and E2. And we assume that E2 is transverse to D, this uh, submanifold. Then what you can do is that you can do the flow, not using the geodesic flow, but using the flow, um, you can flow only along the direction E2. So basically, you, you, well, one thing you can do is that you can flow along the uh, normal direction of D using some metric. But now here, it doesn't, this E2 doesn't quite, uh, it's not quite relevant to the metric. Instead, you just choose any distribution which is transverse to D. And, um, and the uh, Hamiltonian function can be just write it, read, be written like this. So you use Poseidon to cut off, but you use the projection to E2, and you take the norm in that direction. So you can look at this picture. Uh, for example, when it's a product, when it's a product, you have a Lagrangian like this. The normal directions are, you know, can be uh, very bad. But you can project it to E2, then it all, always flow along this E2. And then your flow handle is going to look nice. And that's very important for our uh, construction later. In any case, so uh, you can fit the Lagrangian cobordism into this framework, I mean, all at once. For example, if you have a Lagrangian L1 and L2, and you know they intersect trans, uh, cleanly in D, you can, you can construct a Lagrangian cobordism immediately. For example, you put this L2 times basically R, and then L1 times um, the imaginary axis. Then they again cleanly intersect at this origin along D. And then you can apply flow handle. Uh, whatever version that we mentioned before. And then you have one more direction, which is, which is our direction. But we just add this, R, do this uh, direction, direct sum of the R direction in the product metric. And we can uh, do the flow handle again. And if you do the flow handle for this product Lagrangian uh, submanifold, you can look at the projection. It looks exactly like this. Then we just use a trick due to Brian Cornea. You remove the uh, bottom half, and then you try to straighten it up, and then you pull something out. And this guy is going to be the surgery itself. And then you have L1 and L2 at the ends. And that's how you uh, construct Lagrangian cobordism. Yes? Oh, you add a flow handle to this picture. So, you re so that, that's how you do the flow surgery. So you remove somewhere over here, and then you add a handle, which, is, which we call the flow handle. right? And then you get some Lagrangian. And I claim that the projection looks exactly like this. Yeah. So the only thing to address is that uh, so you have one more direction. So what you do with that direction that I'm telling you that you just use this R direction and you add it to your tangent direction, and then you use the product metric. That's all. 
That's all you do. Yeah. So now let me introduce you to you the introduce to you the punchline. The main example we have is that we consider a simplicity manifold M, and we take the product with its in uh, with its uh, negative, and we have we assume that we have a Lagrangian SN in M. Okay. Now we look at um, the picture here. So we consider SN times SN in this m times m minus. And then we take the diagonal, which is, so these are two Lagrangian manifolds. They intersect at the diagonal Sn, OK? Cleanly. Now you do the flow surgery, but not just the usual flow surgery. The, uh, we want to use the so-called E2 flow surgery that we just talked about. E2 is the direction that on the second factor, OK? So if you do this flow, you can just check the expression. You project your uh, cotangent vectors uh, of t star Sn times t star Sn. So you only retain the cotangent vector on the second factor. So xp, xp on diagonal. So you only take the second p factor. So you do this, then your uh, Hamiltonian function is psi composed with just pi 1 p, uh, well actually pi 2 pp, sorry. So pi 2 pp is just p. So you use psi norm of p along the second direction of t star s2, uh, t star sn. So, but psi norm of p is exactly the flow, uh, the Hamiltonian function that you use to define the dying twist, right? So that's why you, the image of your flow handle, the first factor does not move at all because you project it to the E2 direction. And the second factor, it just flow exactly like the dying twist um, Hamiltonian. Okay? But of course, you, have, you pick up a negative one, uh, a negative power on your uh, dying twist because uh, the second factor over here is a negative, has a negative in the symplectic form. So the whole thing is that you get the following uh, surgery exact sequence, Sn, Sn, surgery with diagonal along this delta Sn equals the graph of dying twist inward. That's the surgery um, equality. Then you just apply the some construction that we had. What you have is that on the left hand side, you have Sn times Sn for the first n. The second n is the diagonal. On the right hand side, you have graph of dying twist inverse. You can put your testing function, uh, your testing Lagrangian n times gamma 1, n times gamma 2, as in the Lagrangian covariance formalism in general. And if you put n equal L0 times L1, you can see that it exactly recovers the side of the exact dying twist because you can use Kniff formula for this factor. And then this guy, flow cohomology with this guy is L0, L1. And this guy with this guy is L0, dying twist L1. If you put an equal graph of phi inverse, then uh, it's going to recover you the fixed point version. But there, there are some identification you need to play around. <coughs> OK. So that's how you prove Seidel's exact sequence in this picture. And also, you can combine with uh, Mao Weihan Woodward's founder, uh, which says that I can, I have an A infinity founder from Foucault category of m times m minus to the founder category of the generalized um, generalized Lagrangians in M. Uh, but it can actually so that generalized can be removed. If you only consider the product Lagrangian or graph of simplectomorphism, which is the case for our uh, long exact sequence. So you actually have a founder level cone. The founder, uh, well, the founder, the founder is of course that for diagonal, the founder is identi uh, identity founder, and this guy is the founder induced by the dying twist, and this one is the that CF SN L tensor SN. So that, that's. Uh, 
So you have actually a cone in the functor level. And then if you fit in this uh, fit in an object to the functor level cone, you can get the object cone that we uh, that I just wrote down for Guangbo in orange a few couple a couple um, slides before. So oh, I wrote it down here. So you fit from this um, you fit L to this functor level cone, you get the object level cone that um, side of original layer obtained. So uh, we also have a corollary if you are interested in the functor level cone. Uh, the functor level category that uh, if you have, if you consider the simpletomorphism, the completely supported simpletomorphism of any AD singularity, then this sort of, uh, uh, then these guys is going to uh, induce functors on the Foucault category. And these functors will be split, generated by uh, actually compositions of spherical dying twists along vanishing cycles of these AD uh, singularities. And this, uh, so we did it for the AN type and then Elsa helped us with the D and E. Uh, I should mention that in before, we know that in dimension four, uh, the simpletomorphism group, uh, the complex supported simpletomorphism group of AN Milner fiber is generated as a group up to Hamiltonian isotopy by vanishing cycles. And it is still not known to be true in dimension four for uh, D and E type singularities. A few remarks here is that uh, in our proof, we also obtained some new information. For example, in the monotone case, Saito's exact sequence holds for, uh, so we know that it holds for coefficient Z if you work also on the orientations too. We expect it to work, but uh, it definitely work on uh, coefficient Z too. In before, if you want to work on uh, monotone cases, it is known only for Novikov coefficients. Um, so this piece of new information is a combination of our method with uh, Biron Cornea's pearly complex uh, formulation. So for um, the second remark is that you can, so now we actually set up a very uh, convenient framework for uh, proving Seidel's exact sequence for general symplectic manifolds if you can improve the uh, transversality issues for number one, the um, Lagrangian coborism formalism, and then number two is, um, is this isomorphism, which is due to FOO uh, in their anti-symplectic involution paper. So actually, this, I thought this would be uh, some easy result even for general symplectic manifold, but it turns out not to be true, even if you assume the transversalities. Because uh, there are some sort of uh, local system you want to make it um, natural on diagonal, for example. So there are some issues to address, address in, uh, in FOQ. So also we can prove this uh, fi uh, the family dying twist formula for fiber coisotropic. So the fiber coisotropic, I give you the definition over here. So it's a, a fiber coisotropic is a fiber bundle over some symplectic manifold with fiber equal spheres. And these spheres should be uh, isotropic uh, least. And then um, for it to be fiber coisotropic, I should have uh, this formula holds. If you embed V into M, um, 2M plus 2D, D is the dimension of the isotropic leaf. Once you have these, then uh, we can construct a Lagrangian coborism with one end equal diagonal, and the other end is this V tilde, which is kind of uh, famous uh, for fiber quasitropic. It's a associated Lagrangian submanifold in M times M. So you can do the surgery, and then you get a graph of dying twist uh, tau V inverse. In this case, then you can recover uh, Wayham Woodward's family version as well. Delta is always a diagonal of m times m. Yeah. So again, if you have stronger transversality results on quilts and uh, coborism theories, 
this can use family version on general simplified manifold as well. And then some general remarks on Lagrangian surgery is that, uh, so we actually uh, discussed the grading on surgeries as well. So we, so, but I mean surgery, so surgery along, along an intersection, when you have a transversal intersection of two Lagrangians, so it's due to Seidel that you can actually uh, surgery in the graded Lagrangian sense only if your intersection is degree zero, okay? And this matches with the algebraic uh, formula if you believe that doing surgery equals doing a mapping cone, you can only cone um, with a morphism which has degree zero. So this is like a geometric and algebraic um, uh, matching. So that's why you can actually interpret the Lagrangian surgeries in two different ways, so we know from before that you have uh, positive and negative uh, surgeries. So you know that why they are different because they are actually different mapping cones and if you surgery with this guy, uh, it's degree zero, then this guy cannot be degree zero because you have a Poincaré duality over there. So you need to shift your Lagrangian in grading and then you switch the order of doing cones. So a priori in, alge in algebra is uh, very different things. And also, it tells you that if you resolve two intersections with different gradings, then you should definitely expect you have some sort of bad things happening. So either you would collapse the grading, which means that if you resolve one uh, degree six and degree four, then your grading probably will, after you surgery both, then your grading can at best be uh, Z2 grading, for example. Uh, and if you, for example, you surgery degree zero and one, then most probably this Lagrangian is not good for floor theory at all. Because you even destroy the Z2 grading. Okay, so uh, after these uh, general remarks, so we, uh, so this is our main uh, theorem for the Lagrangian CPN dying twist. So the actual Lagrangian cobordism we will have is that you have s times s, s times s with diagonal. On the right hand side, you have graph of dying twist. So, and then if you mat try to match with uh, Hilbertis and Thomas, so the first term in their, formula, uh, in their formula is that s times s again. So, but this is going to be, oh, sorry. So it's uh, this E dude uh, box tensor E, and both of these are projective. Uh, projective objects, and this guy will be mirrored to this, and then the identity founder will be mirrored to diagonal. And then this is the projective twist uh, functor, and then it should be mirrored to the graph of uh, dying twist inverse. So this will match completely with uh, Hilbert Chist and Thomas conjecture, except for the connecting maps that we don't um, have, we, we don't have a complete knowledge about. So I have 10 more minutes. So uh, we proved the same formula holds for uh, RPN, HPN, and we also have a family version of projective twist. So you have a coisotropic, uh, projective coisotropic manifold, then you still have this uh, family version too, just like Wayham would work. So I want to mention a little bit about the uh, uh, connecting maps and then motivate this uh, immersed coborism formalism. So the connecting maps in uh, Lagrangian coborism, in general, is counting these uh, holomorphic sections of this orange part. Uh, and then you can actually uh, do a gluing uh, argument, and then you would have a multiplication on the left-hand side, but here you still need to consider some sections where the infinity has some asymptotic uh, behavior, which is basically the intersection of these two Lagrangians on fiber. So this is in general hard to find, so exec especially for these sort of sections, and um, Fukaya Exector has a very long paper, chapter 10, in their book, which is not actually in their book, but uh, so they kind of deal with this uh, situation a little bit. Um, 
But we uh, notice a very simple fact in algebra that if you have a cone according to some uh, morphism, and then you can rescale this morphism by some invertible, uh, invertible element in the base field, then actually these two guys are actually quasi-isomorphism. And, but that's usually what you care about only. And the point is that if you look at Saito's exact sequence, for example, you have diagonal with SN, SN, but the flow cohomology of this uh, H0 is rank 1. So the only thing you need to argue is that the morphism over here is not 0. Then the cone is completely determined just, by, just because the rank is 1. So that's how we uh, obtain the formula for uh, obtain the connecting map for uh, various uh, exact sequence that was known before. And especially this trick is going to recover FOO's uh, surgery exact sequence, uh, well, except for transversality um, issues. So if you assume, if you assume uh, L1, L2 intersect at one point transversally, and then assume your favorite transversality uh, setup, and then you would have this long exact sequence. And you also know that the connecting map over here is exactly that point P. And there's no choice, basically. And then this can also be extended when you have uh, L1, L2 intersect at a connected, clean, uh, cleanly intersect at a connected manifold. Oh. And then for Silo's exact sequence, if you really want to know that the connecting map on the first, f between the first two factors, you need, uh, that was uh, evaluation map as proof, uh, as Silo proof then you need to uh, really identify, because we already know that delta and SN, SN only has rank 1 in uh, flow cohomology 0 degree. Uh, so, but you want to identify this with uh, this uh, CF, SN, L0, CF, L1, SN, etc. Then you need to do some quill unfolding, but I'm not going to explain too much on that. But there is a way to do this uh, quill unfolding to identify that kind of rank 1 morphism with, um, with the evaluation map. OK. To get a connecting map of uh, CPN twists, uh, we, are not, uh, very, we are not completely successful. Uh, but uh, recall that if you, if you have a fiber, cotangent fiber of the, di of the Lagrangian um, CPN Weinstein neighborhood, you have this uh, equality. So the, gen so the surgery, when your parameter goes from uh, pi to 2 pi, equals a dying twist along CPN of the fiber. And it, in turn, equals the double surgery of FP. And then L1 and L2 are two copies of the Lagrangian CPN. So in this case, if you assume the, Lagran the given Lagrangian, uh, well, basically the arbitrary Lagrangian, intersects the Lagrangian CPN at only one point. Then we can completely determine all the connecting maps. Uh, for example, so you basically you have two uh, surgeries to do over here. The first thing to do is that you want to get from L1 to L2. You surgery it, and you are going to get an immersed sphere. If you recall from that RP1 picture, you're going to have a figure A, which is immersed Lagrangian. And then S to S, and then the degree should be 2. So that's why the morphism should be that um, CP n minus 1 divisor in this connecting map. And then you have an immersed Lagrangian S um, hook arrow. And then over here, you have a immersed SN with this L. It intersects actually at two points, but only one has degree 0. So that's why you can also determine the uh, connecting map here as well. And then it's going to give you the Lagrangian, that, the Lagrangian dying twist according to this surgery formula. And this works for all RPN, CPN, and et cetera. And this will match Hubridge's Thomas for even for connecting maps in that uh, special case. And this motivates our study for uh, Lagrangian immersed cobordisms. Uh, so one thing, 
Well, of course you would ask, okay, so what else do I need to do if I know Lagrange immersed flow cohomology already? Um, so for SNK, so this works perfectly well because you don't need to involve immersed Lagrangians. But if you look at the immersed Lagrangian S hook, and you look at this uh, surgery, uh, look at this uh, corboresome incurred by the surgery, okay? So you would have an immersed point along this line. But when you surgery over here, you think of that figure A, and then you have this uh, vertical line, it will resolve that self-intersection. So that self-intersection would disappear on here, of course, because it is, this is just a dying twist. Um, yeah, this is just a dying, well, sorry, this is, uh, yeah, this is just a dying twist of L. So it's completely embedded. So your immersed points will disappear in the middle, which means that it cannot be a clean uh, intersection. So your floor theory is going to fall apart if you use this uh, Lagrangian cobalism immediately. So what's the correct formalism is that, so you can see an octopus over here. You have a um, Lagrangian, immersed Lagrangian submanifold. And then it's embedded everywhere inside a compact set. Outside a compact set, it doesn't look like straight lines anymore. It looks like some, OK, it looks like exactly this shape. Only immersed points appear on these blue dots and these uh, red dots. So you kind of perturb your immersed Lagrangian times r into some cross uh, region projection over here. And this guy we call the bottleneck. And it's actually adapted from, uh, also from uh, Bjorn Konya at some point. So they use, they didn't use the immersed Lagrangian, of course, in their uh, previous works. But uh, I mean, in spirit, it's uh, similar to one check that you use, they use. OK. But in any case, so that's, uh, that's the immersed Lagrangian cobalism that we consider. So it should look like this. Then this guy, of course, has um, um, clean self intersections, and then uh, everything is fine. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, once you once you find this correct uh, Lagrangian uh, immersed cobalism, so you notice that essentially the key point is here. This is borrowed from uh, Bjorn Konya. So the key point is that if you have a Lagrange, uh, if you have a holomorphic curve with boundary uh, in this, uh, oh, sorry, in this uh, projected to C, looks like this shape. Their boundary looks like this shape. Then this holomorphic curve cannot go from one side to the other. And if you look at the, the picture that I just showed, basically it says that all holomorphic curve. If you start from here to here, for example, you consider some differentials, then it cannot go beyond these blue dots and these red dots. So that, so that establishes the compactness. That's how you establish the compactness. And once you have the compactness, then everything you can just argue, I mean, more or less like what we did before. You just use isotopy and everything and some technical issues to be uh, dealt with, but there's no you know, very hard analysis to involve. But the point is that you have the compactness using this sort of projection check. And then the theorem is that if you have that octopus we had uh, just now, then you have this uh, cone uh, quasi-isomorphism just like Biron Konya's. Okay, and then now L1 to Lm, they, they are supposed to be Lagrangian immersion in this case. Okay, uh, well, there are some prospects, and, uh, but I think I basically go over time. Uh, well, just one quick remark is that, uh, so, so this is suggested to us by Richard Thomas. You can consider RPN option. So everything that I said works in Z2 characteristic, uh, characteris characteristic 2. Uh, if you want to move to characteristic 0, we expect no extra complication except you need to correct the signs. But for RPN, this is different. 
If you want to just use this uh, Hilbert's uh, Thomas formula and move it to characteristic zero, for RPN, it has some problems. Uh, so first, RPN, if you consider the flow cohomology, it doesn't look at all different in characteristic, uh, for example, in base, ring, uh, base field C, and then it doesn't look any different from the spherical objects. And also, you're going to get contradiction if you just upgrade that formula directly. So the thing is that uh, so there are some new phenomenon that appear here. So because uh, I think the reason is that we are by blindsided by the spin structures. Because for RPN, you have two different spin structures in the, I mean, in general. And then in what we talk about just now, we don't care about spin structures at all. In this case, the thing is that the two spin structures give you two different objects in the Foucault category. So if you just plug in the formula, the formula uh, Hilbert and Thomas gave you is that you have S tensor S. But now you should get S my, so these two objects are different, and they surgery with the Lagrangian. So you should get S plus tensor S minus, given by the two uh, spin structures. So that's why it gives you some different auto-equivalence in derived. Supposedly, it should give you some different auto-equivalence in the derived category as well, if you go, f go along this line on the A side. And then you should get some mirror prediction on the auto-equivalence on the B side too. And this is an on ongoing work uh, about this RBN twist. And I think I already go over time, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>